Another Monday, another video from Dr. Creepin, just to keep you all going at the start of the week. <laughs> nah, but seriously, I've uh, been kind of ill, so I've had to keep the recording to a minimum this week, but I've still managed to get a story together for you. Uh, those long-term listeners among you will have heard most of the stories in this video, uh, all by my favorite, one of my favorite authors, Michael Whitehouse. But the first one is a new recording, so feel free to switch off after the first 20 minutes if you've heard all the other ones. If you're new to the channel, then stick around, because these stories are great. Now then, my dear friends, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. I've told this story many times, and without exception it has provoked the same reaction. Disbelief. No matter how difficult it is for people to process, and no matter how many conventional explanations have been offered, this did happen, and it's an experience I will never forget. It started with a friend of mine, Stuart, who had always been interested in the supernatural. I, on the other hand, had no more interest in it than the next person. Of course, I am curious about whether there is life after death, and for selfish reasons, but I prefer to leave these things to themselves, as I find the entire subject morbid. I'm sure I'll learn the truth in the end, but until that day I'd rather not ask the question, for fear of the answer either way. Stuart was captivated by the paranormal, he lived and breathed it, but our friendship had developed through another of his passions, film. And although he had often asked me to go on one of his uh, investigations, I always replied that I preferred such things to remain on the cinema screen, <laughs> and to stay there. We'd go for a few beers regularly at Farland's Bar on the main street, or catch a film at the local cinema with some mutual friends. And then, suddenly... I didn't see or hear from him for a couple of weeks, which was peculiar, but I assumed he was simply busy, and so I left it at that. It was 3.04 a.m. when he called. I was angry at first that he'd woken me, but when I heard the sound of his voice, anger quickly bled into concern. Stuart was always such an upbeat guy, but that night his voice sounded distant and there was a new uncertainty I had never sensed before, which quivered beneath each word, unsettling me. I need you to come and get me, he said in a low whisper. What's wrong? Where are you? I asked. I can't talk for long. Just come to the old botanical gardens at the edge of town. His breath became increasingly labored and agitated as he spoke. Stuart, if you're in trouble, call the police. No! He exclaimed in a unique mix of whisper and shout. I'm not meant to be here. They'll arrest me. Just come to the botanical gardens and send me a text when you're waiting outside. I have to go. And with that, he hung up. Ten minutes later, I was in my car and drive into the edge of Wyndham Town. It was an autumn night, and as I passed landmarks which were usually familiar to me during the day, each twisted tree branch and leaf-covered garden took on a more threatening nature than I was used to, the night revealing an unapparent side to the town I loved. It seemed strange to me that Stuart would be in the botanical gardens at night. He quite regularly went away on nocturnal investigations of abandoned hospitals and other supposedly haunted locations, but that place didn't seem like an obvious choice for such things. In the past... The gardens had housed beautiful exotic trees, plants, and wildlife under a massive greenhouse, which must have been over 200 feet in length. But it had been shut down for a few decades. I guess the townsfolk didn't frequent it often enough to keep it afloat. Even when I was a kid, the place was just fodder for a rock or two, shattering many of its countless panes of glass, each held in place by a rusted frame. Although, admittedly, 
my throw fell short more often than not. I know my dad talked about going then when he was a kid, amazed by the place. A self-contained tropical landscape even during Wyndham the bleakest winters. I pulled up in front of a large metal fence. It had been erected years previous, encircling what was left of the botanical gardens in its grounds, no doubt to dissuade new generations of rock throwers. On its gate hung a mud-smeared sign displaying the words, No trespassing, in no uncertain terms. Stuart obviously hadn't bothered with the warning, no doubt more interested on catching a glimpse of something otherworldly inside. I left the engine running, as it was a little cold out, but just as I unlocked my phone, I received a text message. Kill your lights! And so I did. Then another message quickly followed. Don't call me, whatever you do. I began to develop the distinct impression that Stuart and I were not the only ones present out there in the night. A nervousness crept into my breath, and as I sat there looking into the darkness of the gardens, partially obscured by a web of fencing, I felt as though something was staring back. For a moment I was unsure how to proceed, but was then startled by another text message, and... Frightened by the thought that Stuart was in there somewhere, and about to be grabbed by a burly security guard, a local gang or worse, I adhered to his instructions. Follow my light, and get me the hell out of here. And there it was, Stuart's torch flickering for a brief moment, before being engulfed by the darkness once more. I opened the car door, the night uncomfortably cold as it washed over me. Just thirty minutes earlier, I had been cosy, sleeping in my bed. And now this. Climbing over a fence and walking into God knows what. The fence rattled as I pulled myself up. And as I reached the top, I looked across the pitch night and seriously reconsidered going any further. Then, Stuart's torchlight flashed again, and I knew I couldn't leave him possibly injured or trapped, with the chilled October air threatening worse. I jumped down from the fence as quietly as I could, my feet muffled by the whispering grass below. The ground was wet, and the unattended grass and bushes which surrounded the main building made progress difficult. The light flashed again, three times in fact before Stuart turned it off once more. I was sure now that he was growing more agitated, and so I continued in the direction of the once glass building to reach my friend as quickly as possible. But my footsteps were uncertain, and my eyes struggled to pierce the dark. I took out my phone and used the LED light on its back to see where I was going. As I walked towards the large shadowed outline of the garden building, I grew increasingly apprehensive. There were only three possible reasons why Stuart turned on his torch intermittently. One was that it had broken somehow. Perhaps he could only get it to flicker into life every few minutes. Another explanation would be that the battery was low. Perhaps he was lost and switched it off to conserve what little juice it had left. The last explanation was a less appealing one. I switched off my light at the thought of it. Perhaps he didn't want to draw too much attention to his location. Maybe he was frightened that someone else would find him first. The darkness stood before me, a wall of black which blanketed all. It was hopeless. I was going to have to switch the light on to see where I was going. I remembered when I was fourteen and had nearly fallen down an old drainage shaft when I was camping at night with friends. I always shuddered thinking about that. How bad that fall could have been. I needed to see where I was going. If a security guard came and found me, then that was a better outcome than falling into the darkness somewhere unseen. And yet, the thought of a night guard seemed far-fetched. The old building had been derelict for years, 
and it seemed unlikely that the town would waste money on wages for someone to patrol the area at night. Finally, I reached the building. Its base made of red brick, which had held up surprisingly well for all its years of neglect. The same could not be said of the frame. Large metal struts reached up to the sky, forming a huge domed roof. I could see pieces of the frame lying on the floor, and in the dim light from my phone I thought I saw strands of it hanging from the roof, just waiting to break off and impale any unwelcome trespassers. I cringed at the thought of my friend lying somewhere inside, perhaps impaled or trapped by falling metal and masonry. Stuart's light flickered again, and then disappeared. It was indeed coming from inside, as I ducked under and then through one of the countless empty metal frames. I realized that he was somewhere in the middle of the building. Despite having no solid walls, there was an echo of sorts to the place. Subtle. My footsteps ricocheting gently off the concrete floor, and then filtering out into the bleakness of the night. That was when I first noticed it. The cold. Sure, it was always cold in October, but as I slowly proceeded, shards of broken glass cracking occasionally under my weight, a chill in the air grew more pronounced. It bit at my exposed face, and I was convinced that, if I looked in a mirror, my nose would have been bright red. There! Stuart's light! It was closer now, and for the first time I saw the light reflect upwards for a moment and illuminate Stuart's outline. As I drew nearer, the night closed in, and the cold was now becoming almost unbearable. My hands ached from the bones outwards and the air froze my insides with each breath. I was now only a few meters away from the center of that cold, glassless dome, and my friend. The light flickered again, but it seemed obscured somehow, as if Stuart had turned his back on me, the light from his torch bathing him in illumination for only the briefest of seconds. Stuart, it's Mike. Are you okay? I said softly. Yes, let's get the hell out of here, he replied nervously. Then, a new noise joined us. Just as I opened my mouth to whisper across to Stuart and ask him if he was hurt, the sound of broken glass breaking under weight echoed from behind. It came from somewhere behind us and was subtle at first, but there was no doubt. I could hear movement. Yes, footsteps, more pronounced. They were moving towards us. And then, they stopped. All I could hear was my heart thumping, the adrenaline of apprehension coursing through my veins. Quickly, I switched off the light from my phone, hoping to obscure our location. Someone else is here. I said. I know, whispered Stuart. They've been wandering around me for hours. Then the footsteps moved again, this time circling, prowling under cover of night. I knew then why Stuart had caught me. Someone was taunting him. They had been in that broken glass dome all along terrifying my friend and me in the process. No doubt he had been terrified, but now there were two of us, and whoever was circling, they were surely but one. I decided we would act, pick a direction and stick to it. I moved close to my friend and whispered, Follow me. Sure. That word still haunts me. The light from Stuart's torch came on once more. But, you see, it wasn't a torch. And whoever I was standing right in front of was not my friend Stuart. A strange light emanated from inside the throat of what I can only describe as the figure of a woman. The light bled out through translucent skin, 
which seemed to take on the appearance of night and the light forced its way up and out of her gaping mouth. At that moment, Stuart appeared from the darkness, grabbed my arm, and before I knew it, we were running. Our feet scrambled over broken glass, pummeling it further into smaller shards. I looked over my shoulder, and the horrid figure, light source and all, was chasing us. The light from her throat and mouth seemed to pulse with intermittent fury, and as we reached the metal frame of the building, she screamed words of hate and anguish, a rasping anger filled with nothing but contempt for the living. Before I knew it, we had escaped the gardens, that screeching creature seemingly constrained to the boundaries of that derelict building. We reached the fence, then the car. And then, home, where I fixed Stuart and myself a large whisky as we tried to calm our nerves. As it turned out, Stuart had been on one of his investigations, as I thought. He'd heard strange stories of lights coming from the old botanical garden buildings at night, and thought he would check it out. <laughs> he got more than he bargained for, that's for sure. At first, the old building seemed empty. But as the night drew in, he felt as though he was being watched. Suddenly, the batteries from his torch drained. The spare batteries he always carried with him were equally unresponsive, and so he was left in the darkness, alone. It was then he heard the footsteps, and a woman's voice who simply kept saying, I know you're here. I know you're watching me. To Stuart, it sounded like she was pacing up and down, occasionally standing over him as he hid on the floor. God knows what would have happened if she'd found him. I'm sure you've realized by now that Stuart claims he never called me on his phone or sent me any text messages. Indeed, he dropped it in the darkness and still hasn't found it to this day. We talk about that night occasionally, and Stuart hasn't been on an investigation since. He lost his stomach for it, and who can blame him? My unease with the memory of that night, however, doesn't revolve around the fear of meeting some spectral creature in the night. I intend to stay as far away from any haunted place as I can. No, it's more a fear which grabs me occasionally when I really think about what that night meant. If that horrid apparition is in any way what happens to all of us when we die. That we are filled with such hatred for the living. I prefer to believe that there is no life after death. For what we encountered that night was a twisted reflection of all that is good in each of us. And if no good can remain, I would rather not exist at all.